I'm a metalsmith through and through. That's kind of the, the beginning, middle, and end. Okay, so that's that. To me, the challenge is to take something that has no immediate value to anyone and turning it into something perceived to have value, such as the traffic sign, such as you know, golf tees or crushed can blocks or weapons that have been destroyed. Anything common like that, to me, that's a far greater challenge. Both my parents were from Zurich, Switzerland. They came here in 1961 to study at the IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology. My father is an industrial designer, my mother is an artist, so I'm kind of a, a hybrid of what I've learned growing up from you know, design on one hand and art on the other. In 1974, 75 was my first medals class. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I started making jewelry. I started selling in street fairs really early on. Then after high school, I had to start thinking about what to do with the rest of my life. My parents, thankfully, found me a position as an apprentice for a really amazing goldsmith in Basel, Switzerland. His name is Alexander Schaffner. That experience was pivotal in my life because I was re-immersed in the Swiss culture, not a word of English for, you know, over a year. Everything had to be exact, precise. When I came back and I went to art school at Tyler, School of Art in Philly and then Carnegie Mellon, I realized that I needed to scream for some creativity, kind of find my voice so that I had something to scream. I got a commission when I was living in Pittsburgh around 1991 to make a fireplace set. And in so doing, reached for a traffic sign and started raising it. At the same time, I was looking and appreciating the graphics of the traffic signs. And I love the fact that it was very common and readily recognizable. That was my aha moment. I realized, bang, I'm onto something. Wow. We moved to Providence in 1997 and happened to drive by this building, the Ryan Post building. And I immediately pulled over and called the realtor and asked them how much they wanted for the building. You can actually own a building like this and have an amazing studio in a city that's extremely livable, filled with wonderful you know, infrastructure and arts and happenings and support. To me, it's been, this is my life dream, this building. Having been a school and an American Legion building, I always saw it as a community building. So I feel like the community should always feel welcome here, which is why I have a lot of schools come through, different studio tours, I give lectures here, and I want to mentor the younger artists to show them that your dream is totally attainable as long as you're willing to work for it. That's the lesson right there, you know. Don't give up. What drives me in here is a new tool or a competition that is maybe a little bit out of reach or a project like the one we just finished that's a 44-foot tall installation. That's the challenge. That's inspiration to me. I made a set of flatware that I created a whole kind of stretching mechanism to create um, expanded metal in my studio. What inspires me is architectural elements, gritty, urban, common detritus of the city. Things that I can hopefully kind of upcycle into something more cool, usable, neat. A good example of something I'm really proud of is, for instance, the transit chair. Once I created the final prototype, I decided incrementally to change the design to make it more producible, more shippable, and kind of work out the bugs. And that's, that's how I design in the studio, is through incremental changes. I used to make the, the legs of the chair where they would fold down over each other, and they kept breaking off because traffic signs tend to break in one direction. At one point, I was just going to throw it away. I was so frustrated, and I said, no, a designer accepts the challenge. You don't just discard it. And that's where, through a series of prototypes, I came up with a tube that houses a champagne cork. And that ended up being just a wonderful way to resolve an issue, create a suspension, and also bring in the community to collect more materials for me, kind of reconnecting with the community. 
Here we have the focal point of every jewelry studio, which is you know, all the hand tools, some of which I brought from Switzerland. Then what we have here is key chains. We make thousands of these. We just finished uh, an order for 6,000. Then we have the little cubbies and things and stuff. Here is the hammering area. And what happens in the circles here is it's kind of like a gigantic can opener. That ends up being used for coasters or keychains. And this is what ends up getting either turned into a pentatray, if it's exciting in the image, we'll set it aside and send it to my spinning company, which is in Pittsburgh, to turn it into this lovely thing. The way we create our components, for instance, the chair, we have templates that I developed over a series of years that reflect exactly how we trace the lines onto the sign. And then we bring it over to cut out. And then we'll sand on a belt sander, sand the signs to make this, the sides flat or curved or whatever they need to be. And then we'll hand file every edge so that they're not sharp. I'd like to credit Curtis Arick, who is a, a former assistant here, who showed us how to warm up the signs to a certain temperature to allow the graphics to follow the bend. Then we go over to the bending brake. Often, when it's a large chair back, two of us will have to man the uh, brake and really give it all our oomph. It takes so much um, energy sometimes to move these signs. This is the year I tell the my students, that's you that's have to do this with your head, you have to do it with your heart, you have to do it with your hands, you have to learn the hand skills, you have to learn the trade, you have to learn the foundation, and that takes a long, that's a big chunk. You have to also work really, really hard to get your dreams. It's not an easy street. Um, and you also have to have chutzpah. You really have to go out and get what you want. You can't just sit under a rock and hope that somebody discovers you. If you can uh, pay attention to those four and fertilize those and nurture those, you can end up being a pretty happy artist and be able to do what you want to do. There are plenty of us that do this, that can make a living from doing this, and that are able to live their dream, which I feel like I'm the luckiest guy in the whole world. I get to do this, you know? What's not to love? Hardware packs, step-by-step -step assembly, right? 